Hey guys, as promised, here is your Thanksgiving week uh, video over Thomas Jefferson. And as promised, I'm going to try to keep this very, very short. I don't want to take over your time um, on the holiday week. and um, But I still want to get, there's a lot I still want to cover on that. And what we're going to talk about today and what you need to know is just a quick and dirty rundown of Thomas Jefferson's presidency. All right? And to help out, I've got this. I use my son's very old white whiteboard right here. And this is what we're gonna be covering today, right? So at the top, you can read my handwriting, Thomas Jefferson's presidency, right? How he used the National Bank, how he went to war with the Barbary Pirates, right? Um, how he ended the whiskey tax, um, the Louisiana Purchase, right? The Embargo Act, the question, we're gonna question whether he was a hypocrite and we're gonna only talk about his effects then on a war, the War of 1812. We'll be referring back to that every now and then, perhaps during the video if I remember. Um, quick rundown. Thomas Jefferson, of course, drafted the Declaration of Independence. And if we've gotten this far in class, remember all my 1301 classes are at a slightly different point within 30 minutes of each other. Most of my classes we talked about Thomas Jefferson's ideals um, if we and uh, how he created the, we'll just use the term Jeffersonian Party. If we haven't got that far, I think that's in one, maybe two classes, right? Um, don't worry, I'm gonna give a brief rundown and we'll cover it more when we come back, right? But things to keep in mind about Thomas Jefferson. One, he feared, he had a deep ingrained fear of an abusive, powerful government. And in his perfect world, right? He wanted a government that was weak, that could not trample on the rights and liberties of people. Um, because his vision of America was a farmer's paradise, a land where people could have a little plot of land of their own to work and plow as they see fit, right? And he didn't, and, and, and he saw the future of America <clears throat> not as some, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> perhaps not perhaps as some powerful nation, um, certainly nothing how the United States has turned out today, but instead, on those veins of the Greek and Roman ideals of a land of liberty, equality, freedom. And since one of our big questions is, is that hypocritical? Let's just examine that right now. I mean, Thomas Jefferson is the man that said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, written right into the Declaration of Independence. Is that hypocritical for somebody that owned quite a fair number of slaves during his life? Perhaps it is. Now, in fairness, when he was making that statement, he wasn't talking about a slave issue. He was talking about how a king or the nobility is born into positions of power, right? And when people were not born equal, peasants were not born equal to nobility. And he said, that's BS, right? We, we should all be born uh, equal and have the equal opportunities in life. And even though that's not what he intended, still words are words. And words can be interpreted, right? And so perhaps we can uh, take a little bit of a, uh, a deeper look at Thomas Jefferson on that is, uh, is uh, at least interesting statements for somebody, for a slave owner who could claim that all men are created equal. And to be clear, Thomas Jefferson was fairly adamant on the slave issue. He believed that slavery was just, slavery was right. Okay, all right. Um, by the way, I apologize. I hope the window, the glare from the window isn't too too bad. Um, it's about the only room I can do this in. We got people hustling and bustling in the house and all that. So I wanted to find a quiet area right uh, in there. And yeah, we'll see how it turns out. I might have to make this video again, um, but probably I'm just gonna run with it. Um, okay, so weak federal government, right? Uh, the, the, the idea of a farmer's paradise, right? The creator of the Jeffersonian party. And when Thomas Jefferson examined the constitution, the laws of our land, he had a very strict interpretation and in order to keep the powers of government at a minimum he did not want governments to be able to extend their power now remember the constitution is a series of laws a series of ideas this is how our country is going to run but you know how it is when you read a statement you can interpret that statement many many ways right you can have a very strict interpretation which says you have to do by the letter exactly what that statement says right and nothing else or in the case of Hamilton right Thomas Jefferson's quote rival 
and the rival political party they're going to develop from Hamilton's ideas, said, well, what does that statement really mean? I'll have a broad interpretation, right? I mean, I'm not saying I can't do something. And since the Constitution doesn't say I can't do it, I'll go ahead and do it. If we've been, if, once again, we might not have covered this in some classes, but uh, one of the, uh, to give a very good example, Thomas Jefferson was against a national bank. Alexander Hamilton and the Federalist Party that derived from Hamilton's ideas was for a national bank. Thought it would improve credit, thought it would, uh, thought, thought it would uh, build the United States economy, and certainly while I was around, it did a very good job uh, on that. But the reason there was a dispute here, part of it was constitutional. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that the United States can have a bank. The word bank is not mentioned at all in that document. But nor does it say you can't have a bank. And here's the split between a strict interpretation like Jefferson's and a broad interpretation like Hamilton's. Jefferson said the Constitution does not give the power of government, the power of the government to create a national bank. It's not in there, you can't do it. That's strict, right? Hamilton said, well, it doesn't say you can't do it. There's nowhere in there to say we can't have a national bank, and therefore it's very broad, right? Now, regardless, in 1800, Thomas Jefferson was elected president in a very narrow election, the closest election in American history. It went to the House of Representatives. 35 separate ballots were cast between him and, strangely enough, his running mate, Aaron Burr. We'll tell that story when we get back, because uh, it's an interesting story right there. Um, if you don't know, Aaron Burr is the man who's going to shoot Alexander Hamilton. Um, and I, even though we don't have time this semester, I'm going to tell that story anyway, because I think it's a very fascinating story. Uh, but nonetheless, Thomas Jefferson becomes president in 1800. Um, his vice president, who we had a falling out with during the election, was Aaron Burr. Um, but now Thomas Jefferson's in a position of power. Now Thomas Jefferson is exactly where he needs to be to enact his ideals. Not only did Jefferson win the election, uh, his party members, the Jeffersonian party, won most, most, most congressional elections. The Jeffersonian party was in power. And so how well did Thomas Jefferson live up to his presidential ideals? And I think in most classes, we took a vote on this uh, without any frame of reference. And I think you all voted he was a hypocrite. You might be right. We'll see. So let's start right off the bat. All right, let's go back to the list. Use the National Bank. Yes. Thomas Jefferson, as soon as he is elected, goes to his new Secretary of Treasurer, a guy named Albert Gallatin, and he says, Al boy, don't like this bank. What can we do? I'm against the bank. Why don't we see if we can get rid of it? And Albert Gallatin went back and he started running the numbers, came to come back to Jefferson and tell him, and he said, Tommy, let me tell you a story about this bank. I know you don't like it. Turns out it's doing okay. Our economy is in a better position because we have this bank. And there's Thomas Jefferson is confronted by a problem. On the one hand, he has his ideals. On the other hand, living up to his ideals is going to hurt the United States economy. What do we want our presidents to do in that case? It's a fair question. It is a fair question. In fact, when we come back, I'll sh uh, probably on Thursday, I'm going to ask you this question again. I'm going to ask this right now. What do we want out of our presidents? What do we want out of our leaders? Because on one hand, you can say we want them to do what's best for the nation. But I bet you if I asked this question another way, you could probably you, you could answer it. We want them to live up to their promises. Well, now Trump Jefferson has a problem here. He's got his promises in one hand, and he's got what's best for the nation in the other. Which do we want our people in government to choose. And Thomas Jefferson is confronted with this a lot during his presidency. A lot. And he is going to sacrifice his ideals for what he thinks is the betterment of the nation. Will it make him a hypocrite? Perhaps. Are we glad he's a hypocrite? Perhaps. We'll see. Right? Because He's going to look at the National Bank. He says, well, he was against it because the Constitution did not give the government the authority to have a national bank. And in a larger issue I don't want to get into because a national bank would remove power from the states and the state's rights to have banks and things like that. But let's not get too uh, economics about it. Um, he said, okay, 
we'll use the National Bank. I'll give in on that one, right? Another major issue that happens very early in Jefferson's uh, presidential career is he is going to start a war against this group known as the Barbary Pirates. The Barbary Pirates were a group, well, pirates, <laughs> obviously, um, and um, centered out of a present, uh, the present-day nation of Libya. Wasn't called Libya right then. In fact, this area around Carthage um, was quite simply just a city-state dominated by piracy. That's how they generated their wealth. They would pirate all these ships in the Mediterranean. If you don't know where Libya is, it's a northern African country. And ports in the Mediterranean Sea, just south of Europe, right? Um, and all this trade and traffic and, and, and naval traffic going through the Mediterranean, they would raid ships, take their cargo, take the crew, either sell them to slavery or ransom them or do something, do what pirates do to make money, right? Um, and the Bowery Pirates found out during the 18th century that piracy is hard work. Man could get killed doing that, right? Raiding ships. I mean, shit. Somebody take a shot at you or something like that, stab you in the throat. I mean, so piracy is kind of dangerous. But they still wanted to make money. So what the Barbary pirates started to do was approach nations and say, "Listen, if you pay us this much money every year, we won't raid your ships. We'll let your ships have safe traffic through the Mediterranean." And you know what? A lot of nations said, fine, it's not worth the headache. And they started paying off the Barbary pirates. England paid off the Barbary pirates. France paid off the Barbary pirates. The Italian city-states, many of them paid off the Barbary pirates. And in fact, during Washington and Adams' presidency, the United States paid off the Barbary pirates. Now Jefferson came. And Jefferson was prepared to pay off the Barbary pirates until the Barbary pirates demanded double to the United States. They thought Jefferson would be weak. They thought there was this change of government. Their concepts of democracy were not well known to the Barbary Pirates. They thought this was a brand new government just because there had been a governmental change. Um, and so he basically said, yeah, we'll make money. Now you're worth double the United States. Um, Jefferson did not agree with this, obviously. And what he's going to do is he's going to take a very, our, our very weak Navy, He's going to load it up with troops. He's going to send it across the Atlantic Ocean and basically go to war against the Barbary Pirates uh, and defeat them fairly soundly. And there's my question. I mean, so what, right? I mean, okay, that happens, right? Maybe that's justified. Well, the thing is, looking at the Constitution, according to the U.S. Constitution, who has the power to go to war? You might think it's the president. It's actually not true. According to a very strict or literal interpretation of the Constitution, the only body of the United States government that can declare war is the U.S. Congress. In fact, the United States has not officially been at war since World War II. Now, we've fought a lot of other wars since then, obviously. Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf War, right? The war in Afghanistan, and several hundred others. Uh, during that since World War II. So how can I make this claim that Congress is the only body that could declare war? The president has no authority to declare war. Well, that's what it says in the Constitution unless you have a very loose interpretation of some of the words. Because the other position the U.S. president holds besides president, the position he holds in the U.S. military, or she, is commander-in-chief of all armed forces. And that basically means top general. And a general can move troops where he or she pleases. That's their prerogative as a general. So what did Thomas Jefferson do when he wanted to go to war against the Barbary Pirates when he didn't want to pay them? He used his authority as commander-in-chief, he bypassed Congress, and he sent the Navy overseas and declared war. So let's do a little quick refresher on how Jefferson's living up to his presidential ideals. On the one hand, he was against the bank, he used the bank. Second, he had a strict interpretation of the Constitution. He just had a very loose, he was the first president to ever do this. He very loosely said, well, I don't need congressional authority to declare war since I'm commander in chief. By the way, which a lot of presidents have since done. But Jefferson was the first one to start this precedent or this trend, right? 
um, he is strengthening the power of the federal government, particularly the office of the presidency, something he was kind of against, right? He feared monarchy, he feared tyranny. And yet here he is expanding the powers of the presidency, right? Now, and to his credit, if we haven't got there in class, you might not know about the whiskey tax, but we will talk about it there if we haven't already. And he was against the whiskey tax that uh, Hamilton was for. And he will end the whiskey tax during his presidency, help out to small landowners uh, and, and such. So that is a check in his, uh, in his column that he was against the tax and he was going to make sure that it is gone, right? Um, but then the big one, right? The one that I've probably been, th that we all know about, right? Everybody's heard of the Louisiana Purchase. And if you haven't, I shouldn't say everyone, but if you haven't, right? You know, we have discussed it when we're doing our westward expansion um, talk that in 1803, Jefferson is going to purchase, you know, uh, this Louisiana territory, which is basically everything west of the, Missis uh, the Mississippi River, all these rivers that flow in the Mississippi River, right? the land surrounding that area. Now that's a weird definition. In fact, nobody knew what it meant at the time either, strangely enough. Um, it, but just know this is a huge chunk of land, basically from Louisiana, going kind of out diagonally west towards the Rocky Mountains. Huge amount of land. He doubles the size of the United States. This through $15 million, which was, not going wrong, a lot of money, but for the amount of land, it was pocket change, right? To France. Now why was he selling this to France? Well, because France needed the money. Why did France need the money? Because a guy named Napoleon was starting war all throughout Europe and he needed money for his army. Um, this. And Napoleon was willing to lose some territory in, in, uh, in, the, in the New World in exchange for the money to feed and supply his army as he was hell-bent on taking over Europe and damn nearly does, right? Um, now, this is a much more complicated story than what we're going to get in here. Um, just for sake of time, but here's the question that's going to come up. What authority does the president have to purchase land in the United States? The answer is the Constitution is not very clear. And if you have a very strict interpretation of the Constitution, you're probably not in the business of exceeding the bounds of the presidency and making a very unclear, ambiguous ideas presidential powers. That's extending the power of the presidency. Right? If you're strict, nowhere in the Constitution does it say the president can authorize land purchases and purchase land for the U.S. It never, does not say that. So a very strict interpretation of the Constitution, Jefferson shouldn't have been able to do this. Yet he's going to do it anyways. Now, much more complicated than all that at the end of the day, but let's keep it simple, right? We don't need to get down to the complexity of constitutional law. Extended the power of the presidency. He's strengthening the power of the federal government. In fact, during Jefferson's presidency, Jefferson is going to extend the powers of the presidency so large. Am I blocking out the sun right? If I keep my hand right here, maybe if I just hung this up right here and the glare would go away. Oh, oh, oh shit. Maybe I should get a mirror. Okay, um, we'll just deal with it, right? Let me see if I can angle this. I just don't want to show you all my bedroom. There we go. <laughs> I should have cleaned before. Um, yeah, so the, the the Federalist Party is saying that the powers of the presidency, remember the Federalist Party, out Hamilton's party, believed in a stronger government. They said that we should have a strong federal government so we can you know, meet the challenges of the world. Jefferson's extending the powers of the presidency to a point where the Federalist Party says, this is too much. You have made a government too powerful. And there's a complete reversal where all of a sudden the Federalist Party becomes a party of a weak government and a party of limiting the powers of the presidency in this. Um, and so Jefferson has completely exceeded bounds, but he's been completely hypocritical if you want to look at it that way. And yet, was that a good thing? I mean, what happened during just Jefferson's first term from 1800 to 1804? Just in his first term, he has doubled the size of the United States. He built up a meager navy and kept us from paying tribute to par to pirates, right? He is going to strengthen the American economy during his first term, not his second. We'll get to that in a second. Um, during his first term. He is going to live up to his ideals about the whiskey tax. But all in all, he's a, that's a pretty solid presidency. He's extended national power. Yet to do so, he had to go against his ideals. 
he had to go against his vision of America. Is that acceptable? Is that what we want of our presidents? Let's come back to this story when we're going to talk about another president who disagreed with Jefferson on these, these things. A guy named Andrew Jackson, who, interesting enough, right, lives up to his ideals for the most part as well as he could, and yet we're even we're much more critic or much more critical of than say Thomas Jefferson in many ways. All right. Um, now the last point I want to make. Uh, not the last last point, but uh, we're getting near the end here. The other thing I want to talk about once we're, uh, at this is Jefferson's second term. We're going to talk about this Embargo Act. An embargo is basically when you stop uh, goods from getting somewhere, right? We basically uh, stop goods from either getting in or out of an area. Um, in particular, what this was is Jefferson's going to stop American goods from being exported, particularly to England and France. Uh, this happens during his second term. Now, it's not really fair to say that Jefferson's second term, that when he ends his second term in 1808, he was unpopular. It's not really fair. He wasn't necessarily unpopular. Let's just say he wasn't the most popular person in the room. If he had only served one term as a president, Jefferson would go down and like, damn, that was a good presidency right there. The problem with his second uh, uh, term is he's going to get the United States economy in a lot of trouble, and he's going to bring the United States closer to war which will eventually break out in 1812, closer to war with England. And he was put in a tough position, but sometimes his responses weren't that good. Uh, particularly, war is going on in Europe right now. Once again, going back to the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon, the French emperor, was taking over Europe, right? And always a thorn in Napoleon's side, and never and always fighting Napoleon was England. So England and France, go figure, we're at war again. Um, problem is, who's the United States going to support in this? Uh, and it was a big issue, uh, for sure. Someone you think Jefferson himself liked France. He was a Francophile, is what they said. But the French Revolution that had happened hadn't been this democratic revolution uh, that that the Americans were hoping for. It turned. I mean, once again, an emperor was on the throne now, uh, uh, Napoleon, um, and so. There was a lot of backlash that people said we should step back uh, from France. Um, and some people actually actively supported England in this in, in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and there was a big split and divide in the United States. The United States had already ticked off England because, uh, by purchasing Louisiana. Now think about that. We gave France $15 million. And what is France going to use that $15 million for? Well, to fight nations, particularly and, and including England. And to make us uh, you know, the, 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 the most welcome people in British circles. Um, this isn't too far removed from the Revolution, remember, the American Revolution. So, America really is kind of out of France uh, at this point. And both England and France were trying to block American imports. Not into their own countries. France was fine to have American imports come to France. England was fine for, for American imports coming to England. What England didn't want is American imports to go into France, and what France didn't want was American imports to get into England, so they started blockading us. And Jefferson tries to play it off uh, at both sides. He said, fine, if you're going to blockade our, our merchant ships, then we just won't trade with you at all. And he says, no more exports to England or France. Hoping this would hurt the British and French economies, or they get to feeling bad, they get to, you know, and they would say, okay, fine, you win, we'll stop these uh, this blockade. Um, it didn't, because when uh, you stop exporting to England and France, well, the thing is, England and France stopped sending you goods, and the United States was much more reliant on British goods and French goods than British, England and France were reliant on American products and cotton. And the American economy tanks. Uh, really bad. It was, it was a pretty severe economic depression. Um, it will repeat, be repealed shortly after Jefferson leaves office, but when he leaves office, the American economy is in a little bit of shambles, and it puts him, you know, and, and a lot of people were kind of grumbling about Jefferson. Um, not to mention these failures right here, and the fact of that the United States felt disrespected is going to play a large part in the United States going to war with England four years later. And a war called the War of 1812. Now, at this point, Jefferson was already gone, right? Um, this is James Madison that becomes president that's going to take the United States, lead us into war. Not just by him. The Cong Congress um, had probably more to do with it. But that's a story for when we come back. 
So food for thought, ideas and things to think about, right? Um, on one hand, we have Thomas Jefferson's presidency, at least his first term was extraordinarily successful. To do that, he had to, he had to kind of go against his ideals, right? Was he a hypocrite? This is all, these are all questions that, um, you know, we need to think about and we need to look at. All right, I can't guarantee you this is gonna be a quiz question. Can't guarantee. Um, it depends, but I can't guarantee you it's not. I'm gonna think of a word. I don't know what word. I'm looking around the dog toenail clipper. Dog toenail clipper. Don't stick your finger in there. Guys, I want you to have a safe, happy Thanksgiving. Um, if you're with friends and family, enjoy it. If you're by yourself, enjoy it. Be safe. Have fun. We'll see you when you come back. Oh, don't forget to start the monograph and the argument of essay. That is when you have time. All right. Bye, guys.